So we are in the book of Acts, chapter 18. And so just, um, I have titled the message um, that uh, fear is a liar. Say it again. Fear is a what? Fear is a liar. Fear is a liar. Being scared is a liar. Being insecure is a liar. Doubting is a liar. Nobody loves me is a liar. Those are a big lie. Because if you're a believer in the Lord, guess what? The Lord loves you. You are secure in the Lord. There should be no fear in all those things. But the Bible does tell us that the enemy tries to bring those what? Those doubts in our mind. And we're all going to go through it. Paul the Apostle is going to go through it. And we're going to stand there and say, well, why would you go through this, Paul? Why would you go through this? You're Paul the Apostle. It happens to all of us. Here, just to kind of premise it, Paul the Apostle, we know that he's done some amazing things. God doing amazing things through his life. He's gone through city to city, preaching and teaching and escaping, you know, death. And, and so many things God has led him divinely to certain places and people and situations and circumstances. We know that God is guiding him. God is leading him. God is with him. And still the enemy creeps up. And it's going to happen to us. So here in chapter 18, it tells us in verse 1, it says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens, and then he went to Corinth. Um, from Athens to Corinth, it's about 45 miles approximately. Many times you've seen the scriptures that Paul the Apostle, um, on his ventures, when he was going to go to a certain place, he would tell the disciples, hey, you go ahead of me, and I'm going to go by land. I'm going to walk there, or I'm going to take the horse there, or some way to get there. In other words, I don't want to get there too quickly. And do you know why? Because he wants to spend that time with who? With God. It's very, very important that all of us, as well as Paul, you'll see, he took this by land. He went by land. It's very important that we all take the time, like Paul, to take long walks, go by ourselves, spend time with God, and talk to God. I do that a lot Every day, every weekend, I take long walks. I go to the beach, run, uh, walk. Every Saturday, I'm gone somewhere for the day, either Coronado, San Diego, Santa Barbara, Palm Springs, Big Bear. I'm gone because that's my day I spend with who? With the Lord. And it's very important because that's the time you talk to God, and that's the time He speaks to you, and that's the time you get refreshed with God, and you strengthen yourself, or you reminisce with God, what he's done in the past, what he's doing now, and what he wants you to do. Paul did that all the time. No, go ahead. I'm going to go by land. 45 miles is a long way. And if you walk, it's a couple of days. By horse, it's still a couple of days, you know. By ship, you get there in, in a day when you follow kind of his path. But it's very important that we all take the time to go. If you can't go somewhere, you know, far or get away, go to the park. Take a walk around the block. You know, if you ever see me, if you ever see me kind of in the street or somewhere or driving in the car, I'm, I'm talking to myself and it says, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> or God's talking to me or God's giving me my message and I'm kind of giving the whole message there and this and that and, and you're looking at, I'm talking to God, you know. And I try to spend as much time as I can with God fellowshipping because that is a time of refreshment. So when Paul says here, that he had gone, or he had gone from Athens, he went to Corinth. Trust me, he went probably by horse or probably walking, which is a long way. But look at how divinely God works. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, which is a district of Rome, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, who was the emperor, had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So here, um, Claudius just basically hated the Jews, and he told, I want all the Jews out of here. So he, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and Paul, divinely met where? Divinely met in Corinth. God divinely caused this to happen. Why? Because uh, Paul's going to need this encouragement 
right now, what you're going to see. And so by divine appointment here, Paul led them both to Corinth. And then it tells us when they were there, verse 3, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers. So here's Paul going to Corinth saying, what am I going to do? Where am I going to work? Where am I going to sleep? And here, by divine appointment, he runs to who? He runs into Aquila and Priscilla, where he stayed there and worked there. So now he has a bed, he has a job, and he has finances because God divinely led them there. Everything that God did by Paul's life, everything was why? By divine appointment, as God does for you as well. If you look at your life right now and reflect back in your life, you reminisce in your life with God, you're going to say, God, you already knew this. You already knew this was going to happen. I went through this, and you rescued me for this, and you took me here, and you took me there, and you'll see that God's hand was always upon your life, as well as Paul's. And so here he stayed with Aquila and Priscilla. They were working. On verse 4, it says here, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So here he says that Paul, once he was with Aquila and Priscilla, he went in and he started preaching the word of God. It says that he persuaded or he reasoned in the synagogue week after week, month after month, and he persuaded them. Reasoning means that he was evangelizing with them. Part of the book of Acts um, is obviously the ministering of the Holy Spirit and the, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of the gifts that Paul had was evangelism. Paul, when you read the scriptures, he had the gifts of evangelism, uh, teaching, the gift of, of exhortation, the gift of miracles, the gift of healing. He's just a powerful man of God. And I'm going to emphasize that because even through all that, the gifts that Paul had, something entered him which called what? What did I tell you? Fear. And I'm building up to that. Because the enemy is going to attack one day with fear and doubt. So Paul, a very powerful man of God, walking with God, divinely being led by God. Here we see he was persuading the Jews and the Greeks to come to the Lord. A little thing, a little thing on evangelism, because uh, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, someone who evangelizes is someone who gives forth the message. And he has this knack or this gift to give the message of God, and knows how to pierce the heart, knows how to pierce the conscience and the mind, and causes them to make a decision for Christ. That's an evangelist. A really good message. If you want to um, see a really amazing evangelist, look at Billy Graham's um, evangelistic teachings in the 70s. There was one I watched when he was in China. I think it was in 74 or 75 or something like that. He was in China, and he, he, um, you know, he preached a message to you know, a million people there, and many of them got saved. So Billy Graham is an amazing example of, a, of an evangelist. And so here Paul was evangelizing. Uh, many people he persuaded to come to the Lord. This is where the church of Corinth started. The Bible study started. The church started, right? And then it says here on verse 5, it says, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is Christ. It's interesting that when Silas and Timothy had come to meet Paul, then Paul was compelled by the Spirit to testify. Now, why does it say that he was compelled? Maybe he was having doubt already because a little later on we're going to see that he was fearful, very much afraid. And Paul, by divine appointment, sent Silent and Timothy to encourage him. Isn't it true that sometimes we draw strength from other people? I draw strength from people. And they draw strength from me. This is why it's very important that we come to Bible study to draw strength. That we go to a men's retreat coming up, men draw strength that we fellowship with one another because we draw strength from one another. I purposely sit in the front seat because I love looking back during church on Sunday, and I just love scanning everybody and looking at everybody because when I see everybody here, it's encouraging to me. 
that I am not the only one here. You're here too. And we're listening to the same message, being encouraged. Drawing strength from one another is very, very important. There's a scripture that says that iron sharpens what? Iron sharpens iron. And we need that encouragement to draw strength from one another. Um, I kind of wasn't going to say this, but it kind of came into my mind. Um, you know, my son Zion, he's right there. Um, we had a Taekwondo tournament yesterday because we do Taekwondo fighting. And, um, um, you know, Zion's not kind of very clingy son. You know, he doesn't kind of cling to me. He's just kind of, you know. Um, but I've noticed that during Taekwondo tournaments, when we're going to fight and we're waiting for our matches to, to come up, he always comes and he leans on me like this. That's the only time he leans on me. <laughs> He's like this. And I know what that means. He's drawing strength from me or encouragement from me. Because it's nerve-wracking. You know, we're going to fight black belt. You know, it's, it's, it's nerve-wracking, you know. But he does that, and I know he's drawing strength. So, you know, I turn around, hey, you know, let's give it our best, and we do similar encouragement, and, you know, because it's nerve-wracking. And I know he's drawing strength from me, but at the same time, I'm drawing strength from who? Him. Because I want to be an example to him. He's an example to me. And we're drawing strength from one another. So it's very important that we draw strength from one another. Right? Here Paul, it says that once Silas and Timothy came, he was compelled by the Spirit to testify to them. There's a very interesting story that came to mind. It was in John 20 when uh, Mary had come. And she had went to the tomb, and she saw that Jesus wasn't there. And so she went back to Peter and the rest of the disciples. She said, you know, you know Jesus is not there, and, and, and somebody took him. Somebody stole him, you know. And it says that, that right away, Peter and John ran to the tomb. They were just booking it because it says they started running. And it says that, that, that Peter was running, and, and John just passed them up. Like, just passed them up. And, and once he got to the tomb, that he stopped in the entrance of the tomb, and, and he looked in, and he saw, but he wouldn't go in. He looked in, he, he just, he, you know, he was scared to go in. But then there comes Peter behind. As soon as he hit the tomb, he just like jumped in. He says, you know, where's my Lord and Savior? And then it says, and then John went in, and he believed. John was afraid to go in until Peter went in, and then he was encouraged to go in. He drew strength from Peter. They drew strength from each other. This is why Jesus always sent the disciples, how many? Three by three, four by four, or two by two? Two by two. To draw strength from it, to encourage one another. Anytime I go with another believer, I draw strength. Do you draw strength from a non-believer? I mean, you, you can't, I mean you're there to witness or share. But when you go to a believer, don't you feel like this little strength now? Because we've got two believers. We've got two Christians here, you know. And you draw strength from one another. And so here, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. He says, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. They didn't want to listen to Paul. They chose not to come to the Lord. Paul had this burden, this passion to share with his fellow Jews, you know, for them to be saved because he, he knew the Jews. He was, he was a Jew. He knew the culture. Oh, I can save all of them. But they rejected him. He says, you know what? I did my responsibility. I shared the word with you, the gospel with you. You rejected. Fine. I'm going to go to the Gentiles, which is fine. And then it says here, it says, And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So by divine appointment, he goes there to this guy's Justice house, who was next to the synagogue. Now, these two verses I kind of don't understand. You can kind of speculate what happened. But whatever you speculate, a beautiful thing happened. Because he went to Justice's house. I'm sure they were talking about the Lord because when two people come together that are believers, what do they do? 
talk about the Lord. That's the most beautiful thing you can ever talk about the Lord. I mean, you can start off talking about sports, and then you end up talking about the Lord. You can talk about, you know, restaurants, and you end up talking about the Lord. When two believers get together, you can talk about any subject, and trust me, it always goes back to the Lord because that's the encouraging thing. That's what encourages you, you know. And so here he was there at Justice House next to the synagogue, probably talking about the things of God and, and so forth. And I say that because now on the next verse, look what happens. It says, then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed. He just kind of throws that in. So was Crispus listening? Like, what, what were they talking about? What? You know, maybe he was there having dinner or supper, and, 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 he, and he heard, you know, Paul talk to justice, and he was listening, and he was listening. He was, and he's a ruler of the synagogue, listening, listening. Oh, my thing came up. And he was listening. And then after Paul was done, he probably went outside and said, hey, um, that Jesus you were talking about. And, and whatever happened, he got saved. And apparently he went into, um, you know, his house because then it says here on verse 8, then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Just like that. I mean, there's a lot that happened on the verse because not only he got saved, his family got saved, and a lot of people got And then a baptism, I mean, that's a matter of two or three days that happened right there. But the beautiful thing is that when he was talking to justice, somehow Christmas, listen, he got saved, and then God's Holy Spirit did a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now notice how God works in beautiful ways. He just went to go visit him, and then he got saved. You never know who's listening to you share the things of God, or watching you share the things of God. We're just compelled to do the things of God. I remember years ago, I was in Arizona, just kind of popped in my mind, and I was sharing with these, with these this young people about the things of God. Oh, it was like 20 years ago. And, um, and I was sharing with them, and they were kind of like, yeah, 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 you know, kind of like not paying attention. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was sharing with them, and after all was done, anybody want to receive the Lord? None of them, right? And then I turn around to go away, and this 13-year-old little girl says, I want to receive Jesus. Had no idea she was listening. Had no idea she was there. She was one of those, what do you call, uh, with the black eyes and black, you were black, gothic, gothic, gothic. She was a gothic, right? And I had no idea. But she was paying attention. She was listening. All I'm called to do, you're called to do, is share the word of God. But you never know who's listening. So here, going to Justice House, and then who gets up getting saved? Crispus, his household, and then a whole bunch of people in chorus. And thus, the church started. They believed, and then they were baptized. Now, Paul, to reiterate, wonderful ministry. God led him divinely. The gift of miracles, healing, um, encouragement, exhortation, teaching, evangelism, city by city. Just amazing, amazing, amazing. Paul the Apostle. Amazing. What's the title of the message? Fear is a liar. Because now it's nighttime. And Paul the Apostle is ready to lay his head and rest. So he's ready to sleep, probably thinking of, you know, what just happened and everything that's happening and wonderful. And then here comes the fiery dart of who? Satan. And it happens. Watch this. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. It's not a dream. Or I would have said, spoke to him in a dream. A dream is when you're asleep and you have a dream. A vision is when you're awake and God shows you something. So he was on his bed laying down, and then God shows him a vision. And God said, do not be afraid. Because he was what? Afraid. 
fear entered his heart. He says, do not be afraid in a vision, but speak. And do not keep silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. Now, side note, they're going to attack him, but they're not going to hurt him. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Paul was suddenly afraid. Paul, why are you afraid? Everything you have done, God has led you divinely. And all these beautiful things from chapter 9, you know, until chapter 18 and everything in between, everything God has done. Paul, why are you afraid? Why are you fearful? Because it happens. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, he says, pick up that shield of faith so, may you, so you may quench or destroy the fiery darts of the enemy, which is fear, unsure, doubting, insecure. Nobody wants me. Nobody loves me. I can't do this. And you can just add anything. That's a lie from the enemy. Fear is a liar. Doubt is a liar when you're a Christian. Because the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we're talking about Paul, who suddenly had this fear. This fear. After all he's done and got through him. So we're going to get real right now. This is real, but more real. <laughs> okay. I like to be transparent. So, long story short, getting to the point, fast forward, I have a thyroid problem. I've had the past 25 years, and it's never, ever bothered me. In the past month, it's bothering me now, where it's affecting my heart. So about a, a month ago, uh, I would have little, it, it causes blood to force to your heart, and I'm here normal, and my heart will be beating just fast, 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 fast. I mean rapid, fast, 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 fast. And I'm breathing normal. And it was, it's been happening for the past month. And I'm like, you know, what's going on? And it lasts for about 10, 15 seconds. No problem. For the past year or two, no problem. But last month, I had an episode where it lasted an hour. You know, and then, but I'm, I'm fine. And it happened after our Taekwondo on Friday. Five minutes right before it ended, it hit me. When it, and when that hits, I got to lay down. And just wait till it goes away. I have to breathe normal. I'm breathing normal. Everything's fine, but it's just going on its own. Something's out of whack. And so I, I just barely managed to, go, to drive home a couple of blocks away. I got off my truck. I laid on the floor. I was all sweaty, smelly. You know, my Taekwondo practice. And I'm laying on the driveway. And I'm just, you know, it's, it's already, you know, 8.30, 8.45, 9. It's still going on. I'm just laying down there. And, and I'm saying, am I going to die? And then fear hit me because I, I felt my body shutting down, you know. I can move. I can, I can breathe normal. I can think. I can talk. But it was just fast. And then fear hit me. I said, is this where I'm going to die? And I said, I started praying. I started talking to God. And I said, God, wait, you're in charge of me. You created my body. You said in your word, for let us make man. And then you said, so God created man. And in chapter 2, Genesis, you said, and God formed man and breathed into him and gave him life. God, my life is in your hands. You also said in your word that that we're an intricate unity. Everything works together. All, all the 11 systems in your body. And you said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I said, God, I'm in your hands. Right now, I'm in your hands. Whatever you want is fine with me. And what happened to the fear? It left. It's gone. No more fear. And so for a, for a past month... I have not been feeling well. I still do my daily agenda. I still go to my Taekwondo practice. Not a problem, but I have this pressure in my heart. 
or my chest, kind of really weird, really tender. I don't understand it. And so for that month, and this week was kind of, I don't know how to describe this week, but, you know, uh, I would have the little episode still, then I would lay down on the floor during Taekwondo or at home or whatever, and I said, okay, I got three important things to do this week, and I got to get through them, Lord. The fear was gone. I had my doctor's appointment on Friday, so I went. They're going to take blood work and this and that. I'll wait for that. We had our first Taekwondo tournament on Saturday, um, our black belt tournament. Uh, I said, Lord, I got to get through that. Hope it doesn't happen during my fight. And I'm going to teach Sunday evening. You know? You know what I did Friday? This was a miracle. Friday after Taekwondo, I went on my own, and I got on my knees. And I talked to God. I said, God. And I talked to God. We had a heart-to-heart, a really good heart-to-heart. I mean, a deep heart-to-heart. And when we finished talking, amen, the pain went away. I had nothing. No, for the month that I had it, it's gone. For great. Woke up Saturday morning, got ready, went to our Taekwondo tournament. You know, we fought, did our thing, great. Last night, spent my time with the Lord. God, you're amazing. I mean, like this, it went away. The fear left. The healing left. Because God is amazing. And God listens. If you have fear, it's a liar. Because he's going to put that in your mind. He's going to put that in your heart. And you don't listen to that. You talk to God. How many of you ever had fear? Be honest. Only me? Yeah. How many of you ever been in doubt? Just keep your hands up. <laughs> doubt, fear, scared, unsure. But I'm telling you, God always comes through. Paul face fear right now. Do not be afraid. And you're going to go through it, and I'm going to go through it. <coughs> it's real. Unsure. Doubt. Another real story. Long story short. I haven't had a car payment in years. My truck conked out about three weeks ago. You know, I don't know how, many, how much automobiles cost. I just don't. This is God. And so I had to go shopping because I need, I need a, a vehicle. And, you know, and I don't want to buy a new vehicle because I don't want the new payment and all that stuff. And so on Tuesday, it conked out on me. On Wednesday, um, I went to CarMax, and I said, hey, listen, I need, I need an F-150 truck. You know, I need a truck because I got four boys. We have a Taekwondo stuff. We go, you know, mountains, camping. We just do all kinds of stuff. And I just, a car just will not do with my four boys. And so I went there, and, you know, I said, I need an F-150. And I said, oh, this is nice. I'll take this. 68000 How much is the payment? 7000 Oh, forget it. I mean, 700 Forget it. You know? And I saw one that kind of nice. It had like 35,000 miles, 38,000 miles. And, and it was like uh, 30, 38,000, 40,000, something like that. And, and I said, well, um, you know, this is nice. You know, how much is this one? And I, I needed a truck because I was borrowing, borrowing a vehicle. And um, so I said, well, how much is this? This is how much it is. I said, okay. Um, I said, well, um, can we see how much the payments are going to be, this and that? And, and so then uh, did it real quick. And he says, well, the payment's going to be uh, uh, $580. I'm like, oh, $580. I'm not a payment in years. $580? I call my insurance company. Hey, listen, how much is, give him the VIN number. Oh, um, insurance is going to be about $400. $1,000 on a payment? I'm like, that's not going to happen. I can't do that financially. I cannot do that financially. It's no way I can do it. It's way over the top. But the vehicle's nice, and I do need one. Now, I can either put a used engine for 3500 bucks or a brand new one for 5000 but the, 
but the truck is kind of messed up and you know you have to do like little movidas, little things for things to work, like the, you know, this doesn't work and this doesn't work and the window you have to push like down to the left in order for it to go down and sometimes it doesn't work and everything, you just have to do little things to make it work and it's just, you know, and a new engine is just not gonna fix those things. So I said, well, let me see the truck. And it's like a thousand bucks. I don't have a thousand bucks in a month, this and that. So I like, well, can I see the truck? And, and, and I was like, oh, my goodness, I need a truck, this and that. And so I was looking at the truck. It was beautiful. It's out there, by matter of fact. And it's, it's out there. And so I was looking at the truck, and I was like, this is nice. And everything's like new, right? Everything's new. Everything works. Like the clock works, and everything works. And I'm like, wow, it's amazing, right? And I'm like, but I can't afford it. So it was kind of nighttime already. I was after work about 7.30, and I flashed my phone out. I'm looking inside in you know, the driver's seat, and I go to the back seat look, and I go around the other side, and I'm like, I can't afford this. I can't do this. I just can't do it. I can't do it. Doubt, unsure. I mean, on paper, I can't do it, but I need a truck. And so what happens? I go to the back, and I open the door, and I ask the Lord. I said, Lord, you have to give me a sign. God, you have to give me a sign that if you want me to do this because... I just can't. And you have to give me a sign. The car was spotless, clean. You know that new smell, right? And I opened the back door, and I flashed the light, and there was a penny. There was a penny. Do you know what a penny means? I'm going to tell you what a penny means. This is the miracle of God. Because anytime I witness, and someone's going through a difficult situation, if anything... I always give him my penny testimony or my penny story. I tell him, so listen, I said, so this was, there was this very rich Christian man, this billionaire, and very humble Christian man, and he had this young man who just idolized him. And, and one day this young man met him. He says, oh, you know, I want to be just like you and, and rich and famous and, you know, and wealthy and, and just, just like you. And, and can I ask you a couple of questions, sir? And he says, yeah, let's go take a walk. And, and so they go out to take a walk. And as they're taking a walk, the, the, the billionaire notices a penny on the floor. And he picks it up, puts it in his pocket. And so the young man says, sir, why would you pick up a penny? Why do you need a, sir, you're, why would you need a penny? And he takes it out of his pocket and he gives it to me. He says, read it. What does it say? He says, one cent. He says, no, read it again. He says, in God we trust. He says, that's the only lesson you need to know, is that you trust God. I'm going to tell you something. That truck was spotless. And you know how it was spotless? Because they were there with me. And he said, here's a penny. And she knows the story of the penny. There's not, there's not even a lint in there, but there's a penny. And I said, God, give me a sign. And there's the penny. I said, okay, God, I'm going to do it by faith because I sure cannot do it by paper. Long story short, the next day I told the guy I'm going to go pick it up on Friday, this and that. And I get an email on Friday morning from AAA. And AAA says, buy a vehicle from AAA. Make a long story short, I got the same exact car, newer, less expensive. Instead of $1,000 for a total, it's $600. Isn't that God? Isn't that God? But I asked him for a sign. And he, God flipped a penny in there when somebody wasn't looking because it was spotless, and they know that. And I said, here's a penny. My penny's the right. God's amazing. The enemy will put fear and doubt, insecurity, and all those words he will put in your mind. He put it in Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle could have stopped right there and said, I'm not doing it. And could have not went on. There's a beautiful song from Zach Williams called Fear is a Liar. Fear is a liar. It'll take your breath away. It'll stop you in your tracks and your steps. Fear is a liar. Cast it in the fire. So anytime these things enter your heart or your mind, you get on your knees and you pray and say, God, make a way. And God will make a way.
Look what it says on verse 9. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision by night and said, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And what? He continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. For a year and six months, if he would have stopped in that fear, he never would have did this. How many people don't apply for the job because they're afraid or continue going to school because they're afraid or buy a truck because they're afraid and I haven't made the first payment it's doing two weeks. You know, we'll see how that goes, right? You're afraid of going forward. The song says it takes your breath away and it stops you in your steps. It does. Fear does this or doubt or any of those things. If you're a Christian, that is not for you. Right? Because the Bible says, For have I not given you the spirit of what? Of power. Not a spirit of fear, but of power and a sound mind and love. That's the spirit that God has given believers. So look what he says here. Verse 11, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now, when Galileo was proconsul, governor of Achaia, the Jews, with one accord, arose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow, Paul, persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, remember they said, they're going to attack you, but they're not going to hurt you. So they attacked them, but they're not going to hurt them. And so they brought him to Galileo, who was the governor there. The Jews brought him here to Rome, it says, and when Paul was about to open his mouth, because they were saying, Look, Paul did this and Paul did it. And right when Paul was going to open his mouth, God probably went like this. Don't say anything. You don't have to say anything. You just stand there. And look what it says. Verse 14, and when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, now God spoke through him. If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes in Rome, O oh Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. And I'll hear all these accusations. It was a Roman breaking the law issue, but it isn't. But if it is a question of words and names of your own law, your Jewish culture, your Jewish ways, religion, look to yourselves. I don't want to deal with that. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. Paul didn't have to say nothing. He was about to. And God spoke to the Galileo. They didn't have to say nothing. Now God said, they're going to attack you, but not to hurt you. They attacked him, but they didn't hurt him. Then it says this. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Get out of here. Everybody get out of here. Verse 17. Now, this I don't understand, but I'm going to read it. And I don't know how to explain it. Now, they couldn't attack Paul because they wanted to basically beat him up, but God said they're not going to hurt you. It says, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. So they couldn't get to Paul and poor Sosthenes and innocent bison. <laughs> they just started beating him up. I have no idea why. I don't even know why it's in there. But poor guy, maybe he was assisting Paul. He went with Paul there. He was one of his protectors. I don't know, but they started beating him up, which is kind of pretty bad. Verse 18, so Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow, which is a Nazareth vow. He talks about it in chapter 21 a little bit more. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Then they asked him to stay a longer time with him. He did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, which is the Feast of Pentecost, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. He continued preaching the word of God. If he would have stood on that fear, he never would have went forward and done this. He would have stopped. How many of you know someone, even if it's you, because of fear, 
they don't move forward, whether it's a job, right? Whether it's school. You know, someone who has, I mean, the scruples to go to school and go to college, but they're afraid. Like, why? You have the gift of, of ministering, do this, but they're afraid. You can do this, you can do that, but they're afraid. They're, they're in fear, and they just stop right there, and they talk about it for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they're still stuck in the fear. Fear will take your breath away and stop you on your steps where you cannot move forward in anything of your life. But that is a liar from the enemy because fear is a liar. Paul wouldn't have been able to do these things if he would have listened to that fear, but God encouraged him. Do not, (coughs) he says, be afraid. Paul continued there as he says here in the last part on verse 23. He says, I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed to Ephesus, God willing. Do you know how important it is to say to God? to say God willing every single time, because I'm going to tell you, you have your agenda, and God has his agenda for you. And trust me, you want God's agenda for you all the time. I have learned to say God willing, I'll say about 10 years ago, God willing. You know, we said, sometimes we say, oh, God willing, God willing, just kind of, you know, Christianese language. No, I've learned to say God willing, God, if it's your will. If it isn't your will, I don't want any part of it. Period. Because you want the best for your life? God willing. And everything say, God willing, whatever your will be. And trust me, you'll have a peaceful life and you'll be in in, in the path of God. Look what he says here. Verse 22. And we had landed a Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church. He went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia, Phrygia, in order, strengthening all the disciples. He went to all these regions, strengthening, teaching the disciples, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the new believers, and evangelizing in all these cities. But if he would have stopped in fear, he never would have did this. This will never happen if you don't take a step forward, it'll never happen. I've had many fears before, and I don't remember how I overcame them, but I remember just saying, if I don't do this now, I'm going to regret it later on. As, as, a, as a non-believer, you know. And I took chances. And now, how much more of God? Believe it or not, believe it or not, It's fearful teaching the Word of God. I get nervous. I get the same nervous as when I'm fighting a Taekwondo fight. And I found guys who are 6'7", 380 pounds, and I'm like this, oh my goodness. And I get nervous. And that same nervousness I have here. And it's, it's, it's a, a healthy fear, but it's a fear. But I love fighting, and I love teaching. But if I listened to the fear, I would never fight, and I would never teach. And all I'd be doing is just talking about it. You all have a gift of God. They're called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if God shows you, it's because he wants to use you. And there's no room for fear in a believer, whatever it may be. So you have to go to your space, wherever that is. Get on your knees and talk to God and say, God, you know, this is what you call me to do. Or, or whether it's school or work, anything, whatever you're fearful of, God, this is it. Because fear is a liar. Doubt. And move forward. And God is going to meet you there as he met Paul there in all these cities that he's ministering. And it wouldn't have happened if he would have stayed in fear that night. And then it says here, verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scripture, came to Ephesus. This man... 
<clears throat> had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I don't know what that means. He only knew the baptism of John, but he was excited about the God, preaching and teaching the word of God. What I'm assuming it means more accurately is because um, Paul spent a lot of time with, with Aquila and Priscilla. I'm sure they shared a lot of things about what God has done in their life. Uh, Paul, I'm sure, told them, hey, I was on the Damascus Road. I was blind for three days, and God led me and guided me, and God had done all these things, preaching, teaching, healing cities, and all these wonderful things, and, and how the Holy Spirit works, and, and you know, the enemy, and the demons, and all this stuff, whatever. And I'm sure that Aquila and Priscilla sat down with him and, 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 and shared with him these things. This is how God leads. This is how God guides. This is how God, you know, speaks to you in many different ways. Because God's vast. God's amazing. One of the reasons why I love fellowshipping, men's retreat coming up, is when you talk to other men, you get to hear their testimonies in their lives. And, and you learn how God ministers to them. <coughs> how God spoke to them. And I learned something from that. We learned something from that. That's what's very encouraging. He taught them, or they taught them, the more accurate way of the things of God, of the Holy Spirit, how he works, how he leads, and how he guides. Amazing. Then it says this, verse 27. And when he, Apollos, desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. Hey, he's on his way. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. What was one of the things he learned is grace. Remember he said that he learned the word more accurately, the things of God more accurately. One thing is the grace. Probably from Paul teaching Aquila and Priscilla, the grace of God more accurately, and other things as well. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. The last part never would have happened if Paul would have stood back in his fear. I could name one person Oh, so I'm not going to name one person, but there's one person who comes to mind. And I'm going to be very vague about it. I'm going to kind of make up some things because I'm not going to make up. It's a true, but the names and things. So this person is an amazing musician. Oh, my goodness. Amazing musician. Anything this person touches, I didn't say male or female, anything this person touches turns to music. Gum spoons, you know, just music. Gum straws, whatever. Voice, amazing. Everything, amazing. Everything's music. Touches, it turns to gold. So, who is this person? Do you guys know this person? No, because the fear of failing, of going forward and doing something with music. And I'm here saying, oh my God. Goodness, oh my, oh my, you know, just, just try it. And you're like, oh my, anybody know people like that who just have this amazing, they can do so much and they're afraid. You are a Christian. You can do all things, all things through Jesus Christ who will strengthen you, but you've got to be in tune with them so you can enable you and encourage you to do that. Because everything we do is through Christ. Without Christ, trust me, we can do what? Nada. And I know that for a fact. I can't do nothing without Christ, but I can do everything with Christ that he puts in my heart desire to do. And that is a fact. Fear is a liar. Doubt is a liar. Insecurity is a liar. Being unsure is a liar. You know, all those things are lies for a believer. 
Jesus loves you. He has a beautiful plan and purpose for your life, whether you're this age or this age or everything in between. This is a small testimony. I'm, I'm going to end with this. You know, just because I like it to be real. So when I joined Taekwondo at 48, it's like, really? 48? Hey, God, this is fun. I, I kind of like to do it. My kids are doing it. I can bond with them, this and that, you know. And doubt from other people, a little, little doubt from me, you know, and this and that, you know. And I said, Lord, I really want to do this. It's not because I want to be in the Olympics or anything. It's just because I really want to do it. And it's, you know, it looks like fun. And, and God, through just things, had, has brought me from the past six, seven years to be a, a second-degree black belt taekwondo fighter. And I'm going to tell you, I could not do that without who? God. There's no way I can do that at 56. That's God. Now, put yourself in my shoes and whatever you want to do, whatever age you are, you want to do something, God has put that in your heart, then you talk to God to enable you and to strengthen you and to lead you and to guide you, and he will. But don't let fear stop you at all, period, whatever that may be.